So today's lecture is on artificial intelligence, the current scenario, and the future insight. Uh, the lecture is targeted to give you a background on how to apply artificial intelligence, what are the principles behind artificial intelligence, and uh, how you can best utilize in clinical practice. Uh, so basically, uh, by this lecture, I want to create some kind of confusion by the end of the day that is it good or bad, and I would ask. You guys, whether what do you feel after the lecture, whether you want this to come into clinical practice or not. Let's see what the uh, big guns in the field of computer science have to say about it. People have said it's a demon uh, which is worse than the nuclear uh, weapon. Worse than the nuclear weapon. Some say that it will replace human race itself in the coming time. Stephen Hawking says this, and some people say that it it complements us and we should use it to the best of uh, its capacity. However, the guy who has made the CNN, that is the neural network, the the backbone, the, the main neuron of the artificial intelligence, he says that uh, it will replace radiologists and we should stop studying radiologists now. This is his statement. But the radiology, apart from that, even in uh, NEGM editorial by this guy Obermeyer, he is a big guy in AI, he said that, you know, uh, AI will replace doctors and the first to be replaced would be radiologists and pathologists because they are image based uh, modalities and the AI would be the, these would be the first areas where AI would have a big hit. In radiology business, uh, Dr. Paul uh, who is leading the AI in US, he says that you know machine learning complements us and we should use it and we shouldn't ignore it and uh, should not befriend it and uh, we should shake hands and go hand in hand with AI. Uh, another guy, a resident from uh, Maastricht. So Maastricht uh, in Netherlands is one of the leading uh, universities who, which is involved in AI. We have an uh, Indo uh, uh, Netherlands project and with the Maastricht. So Maastricht is leading the AI in the Europe. And this uh, uh, resident says that you know uh, we shouldn't avoid it. Uh, we shouldn't complain later that we didn't actually you know. Uh, uh, in uh, learned the way, so he, he wrote an uh, article on that doctors should now start learning how to code. Uh, uh, that is his ideology that you know we are smart, we we are the smartest of the smartest people. We are smart in our field, but if we start learning coding also, so we will code what we want. We will train the computer what we want to what want it to do. So I think it, it's something innovative, and I am for it. Like you know, I would love to learn coding. I would spend evenings to learn coding because. I don't know what is going to happen. I shouldn't be dependent on somebody else writing codes for me. Uh, so these are the current uh, thoughts in the uh, minds of the people. You know, like is the future of radiology in danger? Are there real risks radio uh, for radiologists as bad as predicted by the media? You know, is this an overhype? Should resident residents and young doctors be afraid of choosing career in radiology? And as you can see, you know, machine is uh, telling humans that you know you are in, uh, insufficient. There will be a time when you you will start making mistakes. And and there is this this is the uh, human risk which has been predicted that man will end somewhere and then computers will take over from there. And then there will be a time when we will be working for robots. There will be no jobs, so there will be jobs to you know clean them or uh, move them from one end to another end. <laughs> so those will be the jobs left for us. This is what is predicted, but but my thought was like, let's kind of, you know, give you the current status, the technical aspects of it, uh, the challenges which you might face into understanding uh, AI and uh, justification for the fears. There are fears and they are justified fears. Uh, illustrate how we can benefit in uh, rather than being harmed by AI and optimal application. So, this is the agenda of this particular lecture. So, AI is ubiquitous. You cannot escape now. You know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, we cannot be ostrich, uh, uh, dig our head into the ground, feel that nothing is happening. We have to admit that it is there in the market and it is ubiquitous and, and it's not something new. If you see from the uh, PubMed search, uh, the number of articles on machine learning, for, where, where there is a uh, steep rise from 2010 till now. So, there is a lot of uh, research going on in AI, a lot of articles getting published in the field of AI. Uh, 
and this is split up into the various modalities you know the maximum work of ai is in the radiography and in the ct scan these are the two modalities which are the maximum uh, uh, harnessed by the use of ai so this is something uh, which any new technical uh, product which comes in the market it, it follows this kind of a graph you know the technology triggers it and then there is a peak in inflated expectation you know something will come up and then your expectations are too high with it but then there is an uh, uh, this illusionment where this there is a slope down and then you reach a plateau phase where there is productivity so where are we right now you know we are at the peak in created expectation our expectations are too high you know it will do everything possible for us uh, i recently saw a bbc video where there was driverless car the driverless car was followed it was following another car and suddenly that car moved away and there was another car ahead so it could not predict so there is something called as association and correlation the what machine learning does is it's currently what it is doing is associations a causal behavior is a human behavior where we can think multiple things at a time and think like an association and correlation together and react to it so time is not far because ai keeps on interacting with the things it so it need not happen that you know it will hit that car and that learn it will definitely learn it learn by other ways but it will definitely be more superior so time Uh, uh, there will be a time that it will be perfect, picture perfect, but it has not reached that phase yet. Uh, what humans can do, you know, humans can imagine. They are compassionate people. They do abstracts. They have dilemmas. They dream and they generalize. And what machine can do, it it does something different. It does uh, endless capacity, eliminate bias, uh, pattern identification, and learning capacity. When you add the two. behaviors together you get ai so you have adaptability autonomous behavior collaborative behavior and what ai would be then its knowledge plus uh, ability to perceive feel comprehend process communicate judge and learn so basically it's having the best of the two machine as well as the man and how it will be superior to us it will not get tired you know it doesn't get distracted uh, it can work endlessly Uh, you have uh, one akshay one abhishek one palak they will retire at a given point of time you may not have the same people again so ai will learn from us ai will learn from you ai will learn from all the from the goods from the bads also you know uh, it's it's not only learning from the best from the best it may be learning bad things from the bad people also and it it's interacting so uh, basically it's a continuous learning process so it it will definitely have an impact because you cannot have multiple uh, people like stephen hawking but it can learn from stephen hawking and act like stephen stephen hawking um so the first uh, just to give you a background uh, alan turing everyone everyone my experience is a code breaker between the second world war the, the, the german code was uh, you know hacked by him so uh, there is a turing test Which is in competition for now for the AI specialist. So, like a Nobel Prize, there is an Turing Award also, and uh, uh, the Turing test hosts all the AI competitions. So, basic uh, thing is artificial intelligence. But what is innovative in artificial intelligence and why it is it took uh, over in the recent time is because of the machine learning. So, it was all artificial intelligence initially, but programming. Uh, wasn't available so uh, unsupervised programming is called as machine learning and within machine learning if you have uh, network like the human neurons or biological neurons where neurons can have input and output and they can you know summate and subtract uh, that behavior is deep learning so you have a very superficial thing which is a global thing like uh, artificial intelligence so computers uh, which are able to think and act is artificial intelligence and once you add reinforcement behavior by other networks where you can re remove bias and act like uh, you can program it that is machine learning and within machine learning if you add neural networks that is neurons uh, that leads to something called as deep learning so the complex network of these uh, this neuron neural networks forms the basis of deep learning how it is different from radiomics radiomics is a sub speciality within the artificial intelligence 
where you pick up certain features and try to predict the phenotype or outcome. It's a very specialized field where you know that certain features would predict something like color of the body, uh, color of the eye, pattern of the, uh, 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 the way you walk, um, things like that can predict that he's Abhishek or uh, some other person. So, so it's actually a very specified field. How it is different from CAD and you know CAD has been there for a very long time. So people might say, what is different between difference between artificial intelligence and CAD? So CAD is auto programmed, you know. CAD is programmed for a specific thing. You tell the computer to pick something. And there are multiple things which can look like that. So like micro calcification might be a micro calcification, might be a talcum powder on the image or can be an artifact due to uh, film uh, mishandling. So basically CAD is not equivalent to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is, it looks within the pixel, tries to identify that pattern and because of that pattern it tells you that this could be the differential diagnosis or this could be the diagnosis. So this is the difference uh, between CAD and machine learning. So machine learning can actually rethink. So once you tell machine learning that this is talcum powder or this is artifact, next time it will give you differential diagnosis also. Do you think it is talcum powder or uh, real micro calcification? So it thinks, you know, it, it picks up the error, it reinforces itself. Uh, this is actually an overlap, but but what is the reason for success? We were working on something called as uh, computers which we use, the CPUs, but now they are something called as GPUs, they are the grand processing units. The difference between what a task could, could have been done in six days is now done in two hours. The recent one which I have procured uh, is actually a GPU. So all these algorithms need to run faster, you know. So Alan Turing, if you would have seen that uh, movie, the computers were like in uh, a full, uh, I think, basement, full room it, it had occupied. And now you see the computers smaller and smaller in size, but GPUs work uh, faster than the CPUs and that's what you require for uh, machine learning and processing. So this is a very simplistic way how an algorithm works. So algorithm works like you give an input data, it goes into the input layer, it is subtracted, it is divided into multiple bits to understand what is happening and there are hidden layers which do does this function. Uh, from that function which is uh, the information that is acquired, it gives an output, it sends it into the output layer and the output is then read. How that is that happens? So this is a biological neuron. When there is an input signal, it runs and then it is terminated. It goes on to the output and then multiple input signals are submitted. Information is processed and then presented to the brain and brain acts. Similar way, this is a, a neural network. The word you have to remember in artificial intelligence, the backbone is the neural network. And it can be it can be called as artificial neurons or it can be called as convoluted neural network, CNN or ANN or NN. So this is what happens, you give an input signal, there are input signals from multiple layers, uh, multiple input uh, neurons, it is submitted and presented and then the information is processed. So both the neurons, biological and the AI neuron, they take the input signal, they have a threshold for taking the input signal, the input from each dendrite is submitted and the generation output signal, so both work similarly. So this is what happens, you know, the brain is looking at an apple, identifying the color of the apple, uh, the shape of the apple, maybe the, even the smell of the apple and then processing it and, and the mind thinks this is an apple. Same way the information is split into pieces, the pattern, the texture, the shape and the other morphological features of the apple is presented to the neuron and neuron understands it's an apple. So both function in a similar manner. Uh, this is the simplest form. So there are certain hidden layers. The hidden layers are made so that the information is directly not presented to the output layer. If I give an image and give the same image to the output, then it will not. So let's say I'm wearing now spectacles and my hairstyle is like this, and I open my iPhone with this face recognition system, and it identifies me. But if there are no hidden layers, what it will do is every time it would want me to wear the spectacles. It would want me to make that hairstyle and the color should, I should not be with beer. But if there are hidden layers where it is subtracting information into multiple bits, then it is understanding each bit. And if those bits, even if there are 90% of the bits available, it tells you that it is an apple. So, this is what happens. So, you present a dog and 
sorry so you present the dog given input signal and the hidden layers would read and then it will calculate that oh it this is like a dog it's not a cat but similar thing you can do for the cat also uh, what will happen is if you have limited hidden layers the cat is presented and the cub is presented the cub also might be recognized as a cat okay or if you have cat and and a tiger uh the the it might be a possibility that cub might be recognized as a baby uh, cat so what we do then we have multiple hidden layers you increase the number of hidden layers okay then you give multiple kind of information you give uh, so we saw this example of uh, human reading an apple and uh, neuron reading an apple so this is what happens you give apples oranges uh, pineapple banana there are different shapes different colors different outlines uh, boundaries and what it is doing is it is identifying multiple bits now texture color shape size and then it is identifying these things and bringing it together uh, and calling it as an apple or a pineapple but if you green, give a green apple now it may not pick it so so there is like you know every step there is something new is happening what happens in an uh, 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 what further you can do is you build up an error system where you say it's an error so i present a green apple it identify something wrong and then i say it's an error and this is a green apple then the algorithm would learns okay there could be a possibility that apple might look uh, uh, might uh, fulfill all the criteria except the color criteria and if it is green i should call it green apple so there there is now error is brought in so so what happens then so you have uh, it says no apple but you then tell the system that it could be apple now and then it learns so a strawberry might be it might uh, uh, consider as raspberry or a smaller strawberry but then you reinforce it bring in the error component and it starts learning so this is how the neural networks would be built up this doesn't end here only because it is very simple so it's not about apples and oranges let's say i will tell the uh, robot to walk in a straight line and uh, at first it will take baby steps then it will start walking a picture perfect but it doesn't know how to take turns so now there is a maze he is, the robot is in a maze and he is entering and then he doesn't know to turn right or to turn left so that call that is called as reinforcement we'll see what how it is done so we saw very basic one or two hidden layers and very complex hidden layers and errors uh, there are uh, two uh, limitations if you have very basic concept then there is bias you will be underfitting you know uh, it will as i said like you know uh, a cub might be considered as a cat but if you overfit it then uh, then the, um, if you have too many hidden layers it will start overfitting so a small nodule if you have shown so many features a small small nodule it will pick everything as high percentage of being malignant you know they is over accurate there and if you give something little bit different also it will identify let's say you put a dot on the image and that also it will call them as a malignant nodule so it it should not be overfitted also but uh, nobody knows that what is the actual number of hidden layers should be in a uh, neural network so this was uh, this is an example that you know you have a chest uh, x ray with pathology you have trained that uh, uh, system to pick up pneumothorax but the moment you put a checkerboard on it the system loses its capacity to identify because it was overfitted it does not want any other thing apart from what it has been trained for so this is called as overfitting and this is what happened in the uh, one of the algorithm which was made uh, which was trained on the national lung screening trial in the us it overfitted using those kind of images when it was applied to in the uk in the oxford university data it did not pick the accuracy went down and when they saw the uh, reason behind it they found that it was overfitted for the us data so this was the backbone of the how uh, this was the basic concept you know how we think the we need neurons but how neurons function and neurons are the uh, as i said are the backbones of the artificial intelligence but there is a layer called as machine learning so machine learning is the process and neurons are the work horses how this process takes place so machine learning can be of three types and different types of machine learning are used for different kind of you know weather prediction is done by something else banking accuracy security uh, traffic um image processing they are done by different kind of machine learning algorithms to simplify it there are three simple uh, terminologies to remember supervised unsupervised and reinforced so what is supervised learning in supervised learning you draw a region of interest you tell this is the lung tumor 
and then we will send that data to the algorithm and there is a training set and a test set. First you give the training set, you train on a number of images, keep telling the system this is lung tumor, lung tumor, lung tumor. And then you give a set where you have not marked lung tumor, it identifies the lung tumor. So this is like a supervised learning. I, I will tell the computer every day that this is Navnat, this is Navnat and this is Navnat. But when I give a bunch of other people with him, the computer should identify. So that is a training and a test data set. So what happens? You clean the data, you split into two parts. One is your test and one is your uh, training data set. And that data set you present it to the computer. Computer understands what is to be predicted and it does the algorithm and then it predicts whether this is whether you are the one who would actually acknowledge whether this is right or wrong in unsupervised learning you give a bunch of uh, uh, things which where there are certain things can be grouped together so uh, let's say there are uh, four four different patterns of coins you give it in a bag of uh, bag to the computer and computer by the various features like shape, signal intensity and other pattern and other things, it groups people into different categories, you know, classification. Let's say I give uh, different kind of uh, breast with mammograms, some normal, some with benign lesions and some with malignant lesions and it identifies the pattern, it uh, groups into three groups. Computer does not know which group uh, would be benign or malignant but it says that these are similar, these are similar, these are similar. Now it's up to you, you want to call this as normal, this is as Bilex 2 and this is as Bilex 5. Okay, so this is what is unsupervised, where you have not given what is known. You have not informed the, uh, the algorithm what is known. So this is unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning ends there, but we saw that you know you need to bring in error. You know? This was, uh, it might be possible that you know a small tiny lesion is missed and it is categorized as normal or a rounded mass which is cystic with the malignancy has been called as Barrett's 2. So you tell the system now that there were some errors and you have to now correct those errors and it what it will do is it will go deeper into those images and understand like a human why did I go wrong? You know, I was right for these but why did I go wrong for this? So it will put more attention try to extract more features from those images and try to understand that Okay, these were the reasons I went wrong. Next time I will not make this mistake. And when you present certain cases again, it will not make that mistake. So that is called as uh, reinforced machine reinforcement machine learning. So this is what happens, you know. As I said, you train the robot to walk in the straight line, but then there is a wall in front of it. There is a right turn, there is a left turn. So so the machine reinforces itself that when a, a wall comes, I have to take a turn. But where to take the turn? Where the passage is open? I take turn that side, another wall comes, where to take turn, where there is. So all this is reinforcement. So this has to, this is called as reinforced learning. Then uh, comes the natural language processing. So we saw all the image processing now, but we have a lot of data which is in the unstructured format. You know, your reports have information. Let's say a lung CA a cancer patient has a report. Uh, it is in an unstructured format. You've written the upper lobe mass measuring this node in the arteropulmonary window measuring this and uh, hepatic metastasis. So what natural language processing does is it takes the unstructured format of data and structures it. Okay, it will start finding the pattern which is similar on multiple reports. So if you give 100 lung cancer reports, they all will have some similarity. Lung mass measures and in the lobe. So it will identify those words which are common to each other. This is what is happening in the mobile these days. You know, by the time you will want to write many, many, it tells you happy returns of the day. Okay. So this is like a, a, a way of na natural, natural language processing. It understands your thought process. What are you going to say next? So uh, what it does is it monitors full activity. What is happening from the patient information to age, which unit it belongs to, what all information is written, something similar to what you are doing these days. You are reading newspaper on the phone, you are listening to music, you are doing multiple activities, it is collaborating all that information, it is identifying what kind of person you are. Similar to that, what a report is, and it will extract that information and auto identify the lesions. So it will start identifying from the report probable lesions on the image. So you don't even have to identify the lesions or put ROI or region of interest on the image. So this is language, natural language processing. 
So we saw the basic principles, you know, how AI works. We saw neurons, uh, we saw machine learning. But what is actually in practice and what has been established is radiomics. So what you do is you acquire the images, you segment that part because you don't want to send the whole information to machine learning algorithm. You want to only send a selected part of the image and you want to identify that particular area, what it can do for the patient or an individual. So you have an image of the whole body, a CT scan, you do image segmentation, extract the tumor out of it, then you sub submit this particular extracted image for feature extraction. And these extracted features are then analyzed. So what happens, something like this. You who have a uh, lung CT segmentation has been done, segmented lobes are extracted, those lobes are then, you know, uh, further uh, analyzed, features are extracted and then you can either print the genotype, phenotype, whatever, emphysema, lung malignancy, nodules, lung volumes, uh, lung capacity, whatever you want to do with that image. So, uh, that brings us to the major application now. And, and uh, again, I would highlight that we have extensively explained artificial intelligence in this article. So, what we are trying to do by using all this information is, uh, this is called an omics data. So, what is omics data is whatever data is available from biology, from, uh, but, uh, from the pathology, from radiology, you collaborate that data and, and then analyze that data and give us precision medicine. So, this is an example. So, where are we right now? What we are predominantly doing is we are using clinical data, individual data and trying to do omics out of it. And soon, what we used to do till now is we were, what we were doing was clinically driven research. But time will come and it will be data driven research, you know. Full data would be used to derive the research and to predict outcomes and, and the behavior of the humor. So, what people say is data is the new oil. And, and the it, it's actually it is the new oil. The way the science is progressing currently in the area of artificial intelligence, everybody is after data. People are saying, "Oh, data is, is so expensive now. Can you give your data to me, even if it is anonymized?" Because you want to cross validate. What happened in the U.S. Uh, screening trial we saw when they applied on the Oxford study, it did not work. So any algorithm should have uh, you know wider applicability, reproducibility also. So, this is why we need data. So, these are some case scenarios where uh, there has been success, CAD in uh, breast, you know, the basic form of AI, uh, then picking up brain hemorrhages, mid mid midline shifts, uh, uh, pulmonary nodules, pneumothorax, uh, tuberculosis. Uh, these are some success stories of uh, uh, the best, but we do have our own success stories, and I would say that, you know, uh, when I started doing it in 2011, we were yesterday having a laugh over it. Many people didn't believe that, you know, this is waste. Many people used to say this is wastage of time, may not have clinical applicability. Even DMD didn't understand that, you know, this will have applicability. But what we have achieved over a period of time, we are now a collaborator with the uh, Brax Challenge. We are supplying data. We are segmenting our own data and giving it to them, you know. We have our own segmentation tools with us. Uh, and, and there are only seven institutes across the world which supply data to Brax. We are one of them. Apart from that, uh, we started from very basic, you know, uh, identifying neurocystic psychosis pattern. Can you differentiate neurocystic psychosis from tuberculoma, one of the al basic algorithms? Uh, we went ahead, uh, did uh, using portal vein and hepatic artery supply, can we segment tumors and say whether it, they are hemangiomas or metastasis? So, if you put an ROI on the hepatic artery and the ROI uh, pattern matches with the uh, hepatic artery supply, it is a metastasis. If the pattern matches with the portal vein, uh, then it is an hemangioma. Uh, we went ahead uh, with characterizing using the mammogram, uh, automated segmentation of the pulmonary vessels, juxtapleural nodules, hepatic brain metastasis, the EGFR mutation to this current challenge, uh, predicting outcomes in the EGFR cases, and uh, the current one which we publish is the, uh, the differentiation of. Uh, tumor edema, tumor core and enhancing core within the glioma with an accuracy of 93%. And last but not the least, the Nilesh's recent paper on uh, prostate urethra uh, segmentation. So, by this algorithm, you can extract a urethra within a fraction of a second from the whole prostate. So, which is very important for brachy therapy, you know. Otherwise, they had to uh, contour uh, urethra on all these six sections. So, this is some of our success stories, but how they can be applied. So, usually, this is the workflow of 
we look in facts, we get the images, we review them and we dictate the report. What if these algorithms are there inbuilt in the system? So in the moment uh, you have these algorithms, it will extract a tumor. It will tell you that these are the possible locations of the metastasis, these are the sizes. Do you want to accept or reject it? Like you know, and it will generate a report for you also. So upper low mass, because uh, just imagine a system which has learned to segment lung, to identify right and left, and to measure the tumor, to identify the tumor, to segment the tumor, to the volume of the tumor, and then re generate a report. So it will automatically say, right lung, upper lobe mass, measuring 2.3 cm with a volume of 10 cc. And if you have a previous scan and it automatically compares, it says the previous volume was 9 cc, now it is 10 cc, the maximum dimension cranial model was this and this. So if, so if it is incorporated in the radio, what is the biggest challenge is that we are currently having uh, three big companies like Philips, Siemens and uh, Fuji uh, and the GE, these four companies are channeling the packs. They don't want third party AI algorithms to come on their system. This is the biggest limitation because we, we are using their packs. They don't want a third party uh, simple algorithm to come and, and they give you a reason like, you know, uh, virus and hacking and other things, but they don't want that to happen. They want to build up their own and sell it to you. This is their policy. So this this accept and reject would be something which will be a kind of reinforcement machine learning. So if you are accepting multiple things, the algorithm would learn that I was accurate most of the time. The moment you reject, it will understand that there was something wrong. It is not questioning you. The only thing which is not there in machine learning is questioning, backfire. You know, why did you reject me? <laughs> if that comes, then it will be the complete, you know, holistic picture. So, it is still, till now what is happening is it's getting reinforced. Maybe you are wrong and you are teaching wrong things. <laughs> so, they, they, I read a uh, small cartoon, you know, like, uh, I can be good, I can be bad, depends who's training me. So, it, it, it all depends on that. So, if the questioning power comes in the machine learning, then that would be the holistic picture. So this is an example, you get a tumor, you can, you know, it tells you a list of things. Do you want to put it as lung or liver or whatever and then you select that, it will measure and give you a report. So, what uh, finally would be, what uh, the next step would be to keep AI independent, to keep radiologist independent and then you do your reporting and then it sends you an alarm that you you might have been wrong. There are certain other reasons. Would you like to reevaluate? And then you reevaluate. You know, like an independent, uh, we say it like you know, non-biased approach. Otherwise, if it might happen that in a due course of time you might stop picking up lesions because com you know that computer will pick lesions for me. <laughs> so that would be the ideal picture that you know you don't directly use AI to uh, you, uh, detect or diagnose or report, but you keep it as a standalone. Once you have reported, you have committed your report, and then it tells you that they, these are the possible findings which I have found. Do you want me to add those findings in the report? Would you like to amend the report? That should be the right way to it. Uh, most of us uh, think that AI can only do this part of it, like you know, the diagnostic interference and decision making. But imagine when you have data from an institute like Data, where there is electronic medical records, there are patient records and survival data, and the kind of investigations done for that those patients. Imagine there is a patient in the ICU who is having dropping saturation, who is on nivolumab, uh, received only one shot of nivolumab, third day presentation, and it before doing CT, it, it might tell you the CT picture of it, and it might tell you the diagnosis also, if you have all the data with you. So, from the patient records, it can tell you which is the best modality to be used. Let's say you have a patient with the, uh, a leukemia on methotrexate, hydros methotrexate, it tells you don't do a CT. MR is the modality for choice, of choice. In the MR, do only these two sequences. Don't run the whole, whole panel of MR. And when you are doing the MR, use a fast sequence. Because the patient might move. These patients are prone to move in the gantry. And then it will segment that part out and tell you the diagnosis. So, the front bit, which modality, what is the optimum technique, how to modulate that technique, KVMA in a pediatric patient, patient is 5 kilo, uh, pediatric patient, it will automatically adjust the KVMA in the machine, uh, pick up that algorithm uh, protocol to be used for that patient and does, will do the imaging segment that particular thing, give you the report and that would be the final outcome. So see that's the way it will change our workflow. 
and it will do auto auditing also how many times you were right and how many times you were wrong at the end of the day so this is what happens you know in a big center like ours it will from the emergency department from other departments it will collate information it will predict what kind of imaging is required you know there is a cardiac patient you need to do cardiac mr or a uh, cardiac ct or auto segmentation by the time you reach your console this tumor is already segmented and presented in on the platter to you that this is the tumor please report now uh, so how we feel that it's all very nice looking you know but uh, i would say if i have to use ai i would spend more time on what more time with family uh, more time on research and more party you know like <laughs> so so basically you have money to fund it Yeah, maybe like some uh, algorithm will sell also. We we'll make some money to sell. So look, look at the, look at it this way, you know. See, there's a friend who's going to do most of your work. You reach home, you know. I saw one of the videos where AI can uh, uh, from your fridge can pick what kind of food you like, and when the mushrooms are over, it predicts that it puts in your shopping list. Mushrooms are over, and it's there. Yeah, it's, it's called as yeah. and it uh, because in the uk and us everything is barcode thing so it from the barcode reads this, this is wine and this would meet 8 degree temperature it doesn't need that uh, frozen temperature so it can auto modulate the temperature also so time is not far when we will be having more relaxed life i would say you know we have to do less things so better patient outcomes better uh, uh, decision making and increase efficiency you know Uh, let's say I saw a recent algorithm where what it does is, if you have 100 mammograms in a day, imagine a panel is taking 100 mammograms in a day, and by 5 o'clock you last 10 mammograms, what is her efficiency on it? She's already brain drained. But what AI can do is, if you have 100 mammograms with the AI algorithm applied on it, it will move the list and adjust it according to priorities. So the first 25 mammograms would be the one which have findings on it. And it will show the findings. It will tell you these have microtransformation, speculated mass, and virus category. This we want you to accept this report. Go ahead. The last mammogram will be probable ones, which are normal ones, which already the algorithm has screened and wants you to screen. So work is adjusted. So this is something. Uh, I'll come to that. So the height is AI will replace radiologists. I would say it will aid and help us if we integrate it in time. You know, we have to. Uh, as i said uh, be friends with it stop training that you just we do more than what the ai can do you know uh, we do alpha sounds <laughs> recently we started doing alpha sounds now we, uh, we do biopsy we do we do many other things you know we we question each other and and we talk to each other so so we we need some as i said we need even to run the algorithm we need somebody to press the buttons also so we do need it all this is not that we are uh, uh, live is ending here uh, the machine is it all this i really don't agree with it there is a uh, lot of input which is which is required you know you go to mdts to do clinical decision making you actually are intervening and patient want to see a human not a robot at the end of the day there has to be a human touch so so it's not that we, our uh, story is ending here would you need a robot doctor i don't know anybody would like to interact with a robot doctor you might take advice from the robot but you would still want a human to touch and feel and treat the patient uh, there are certain legal and ethical issues which we have not touched on everything is looking very uh, good but it's patient data it's patient privacy uh, data belongs to the patient it's, it's a Uh, I may not want my data to be shared with anybody, even if it is anonymized. So, and people are, you know, this AI algorithm uh, writers are going to private hospitals, just telling them we will make an algorithm for you. You give us our data. But what we do in our institute, we write ethics of uh, letter to IEC. We do MOUs. We uh, write what kind of funding. So, currently, whatever MOUs we are writing with these companies, we are asking 15% of the revenue generated, which will come for the patient benefit. You know. There, something has to come for the future patients. Even though the data belongs to the patients who have been already treated, mm -hmm. but some revenue has to come. So there has to be law reinforcement. You guys are going to be practiced very soon, and there will be people who will be approaching. You know, can you give me a hundred CT scans of patients with normal brain? You would easily happily give it. But have you? And do you know the uh, legal implications? What are the rules? So please do read the legal aspects of 
uh, yeah, it is very important that uh, this is a new emerging technique. We shouldn't be putting ourselves into medical legal issues without knowing the ifs and buts of it. And uh, the, these are the five pillars of uh, ethical framework in radiology which has been made by the Canadian and the French group. Uh, there are two white papers on uh, AI. Uh, one is by the Canadian group and one is by the French group. So it has to be autonomous. It should not do any harm. It should be freely uh, with consent given by the patient. You know, It should not be like you, you've taken a blanket cover that we can use any of your data for any purpose. It should not be like that. Patient has to consent that my anonymized image data can be used for machine learning. It has to be stated that in a, in a retrospective manner, it has to be consented by the institutional ethics committee that this data can be used. And it should be explicit, it should be uh, widely applic uh, applicable and should be given at a minimal cost. It should not be sold. That is what Canadian Health Group feels that because it is a retrospective patient data which has been used, the patient will not get benefited, but the future patient should get benefited. So it has to be either at a very low cost or should be given free of cost. What we can do as a radiologist to help the field of AI adopt at a very uh, early uh, stage, learn about the benefits, potential pitfalls and limitations, learn about IT and coding. I don't know how many of you would be interested, but a little bit of understanding because you know, uh, it's, it's, it's good to be involved into the process of it rather than just be an uh, end user. If you know how to do it, you may not do it, but you can tweak it. You uh, know how to channel it. So learn a bit of shape conversation on the future of medical health. So people should talk about it. They should not, you know, keep it to themselves. Or oh, your fears should come out, and you should discuss those fears. What other people can do. So faculties and communities, they should encourage and engage people into AI. A good AI, I would say, uh, legal AI, uh, which is ethical AI. And the uh, organizations should not just give away their data without any understanding of the legal implications and other things. So. And we should be very smart with the uh, IT world as well, you know, uh, that we need revenues, we need, so another thing which we have made a mandate is any algorithm which is developed would be given free to NC. So if there are 150 hospitals in a national cancer grid, all will get that algorithm free of course. So certain smartness we also have to be, we just cannot be like, oh, yes, you want data, one publication I'll get out of it, you will also get an algorithm and end of story, it should not be like that. These will be sold in millions maybe. Who knows which algorithm is going to work the best. So that should be kept in mind. Uh, this is a uh, SWOT analysis of my understanding that the strength we have in India, this is SWOT analysis of application of AI in India, is that we have availability of big data, we have emerging talent pool, we are smart people. Our IT guys are going to US, our radiologists are working everywhere. Uh, we have availability of qualified persons at every level. Uh, what are our weaknesses? We have very limited resource allocation. I have been struggling to get funding from DBT, but a hospital is not understanding that this is going to come up in a big way. It's not a big money. Hospital can invest on this particular uh, cost. So we don't, we have very limited resource allocation in uh, in our own country. We have lack of awareness and acceptability. Maybe I don't know how many of you after this would want to learn more, go read more about AI. So we have very little awareness that you know this is going to come up in a big way. Standardization of data. Any data is a data. No, any data is not a data. A standardized data is a data. It has to be well anonymized, well annotated. It has to be a quality data. Opportunities, we need funding from other organizations. We need to have public private partnerships and threats. As I said, uh, we might be working for robots to clean them, to make them go to bed or maybe you know, repair them. So these things might be required in a due course of time. Uh, this is just to highlight that this is our vision at TMC to have a, a, a AI lab which would have a radiology hub, a pathology hub, uh, an R&D hub where we will have our own. So I believe in capacity building. I don't want to buy things for somebody and apply it. That's the easiest way. I feel that you know uh, people should get involved into doing it. There should be IT professionals in the hospital who should be working for us, with us, and we together build up some algorithm and we sell it also and through the hospital. A hospital markets as a uh, TMZ algorithm on nodule detection, feature prediction or whatever, and that money is used for the benefit of the patient. So with that I end that, you know, if we are dismissive and defensive, the time is going to come when the 
private, public, these IT guys would, uh, you know, surpass us. They will make things better than us. And and then we will feel, oh, we, we should have done the other way around. We should have been working with them rather than, you know, being against them. And it's AI is something you can into democracy. It's inspired by the people. It's created by the people. And it will impact the people. So, so by this lecture, I hope that... Uh, uh, we all go back, read a bit about it, and inculcate this into the into our practice. I thank my team and my collaborators. Any questions? I'll be happy.